Last session of the day, never good. Yeah. Last session of the day on the last day of the week. Last day of the, the sessions. All right. Um, we actually have more content on this one than we probably have time. So I'm going to get it get going here. Uh, I'm Ed Baldoff with SolidFire slash NetApp. John Griffith. Griffith. Same place. SolidFire or NetApp. Um, we're going to try. We're going to go through some of these slides. Then we're going to skip a bunch and we're going to try to do a live demo. So yes, we're the hopefully the demo gods will be with us. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about consuming Cinder from Docker. Uh, yeah, that's a good title. Although there's some beyond Docker in there. Um, so the first thing that everybody asks is, hey, Statler, what's Cinder? <laughs> Who cares, Waldorf? We're, he's going to talk about Docker. Because every time you put a, a Docker in the title of a presentation, you usually get more people. Hey, where are all the people? Hey, we're going to talk about Docker. <laughs> Come on in. Um, Tell all anyways. your friends. <laughs> So if you're, we're at an OpenStack conference, so this is a, a little less of an importance of the slide. We usually go through and say, what is Cinder? Um, most of you guys are probably familiar with that since it is OpenStack. Um, and it's, a, it's an abstraction layer for a pool of block storage devices. Um, back end for, we, we support many back ends. Um, John keeps quoting that there's 80 of them in there uh, that are supported in the upstream tree. Uh, I haven't counted that, so I can't validate, so blame it on John. It could be 82. I yes. could be wrong. Um, so you can keep plugging in back ends and you can scale it out. It's, uh, the scheduler can figure out where to place things. It's kind of like having an infinite number of disks so you can hot plug and, uh, and unplug from your instances or your containers, right? So um, somewhere in here, Docker made the Docker volume uh, API. You can do things like create, uh, delete, attach, detach, and who put snapshot in there? Because that's so these are actually, it. these are the things that I say you need in a cloud. Right, storage. okay. Those are the things John says. Those are the only things you need. But so <laughs> Docker supports the first four and a list command. The snapshot stuff is not in the basic Docker API. We'll talk a little bit about more about that do. in a bit. But uh, we have some ways to make that happen, so. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's the stuff that a lot of people want. And again, we can make some of this happen. Uh, this is John being opinionated and blunt. These are you know, other storage features that you may want. Replication, consistency groups, backup, migration, so on and so forth. You don't really want those. Um, yeah. Maybe you want them. Some people want them. And he made the presentation, but hey, I thought this would be a Docker talk. And which character was that one again? Uh, Gonzo? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Docker's best ever geek bait, and they're, they're flocking in a few. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, OpenStack and containers, that's one way of doing it. You can put containers on OpenStack. Uh, container orchestration are around OpenStacks from Magnum and Kubernetes. There's a lot of things. I'm going to actually try to do a Mesos demo with uh, Docker under the covers here at the end. Um, and that's where we get the unicorns for everyone. Also, driven to interesting ideas and plans. Uh, again, we see Cola, we th see Magnum. Um, how do we use containers to deploy OpenStack? How do we use open have OpenStack consume containers? Uh, so on and so forth. But let's bypass a little of the hype and do some cool stuff. Uh, and. So, oh, you, yes, we got to build this out. So, uh, new thing, you know, the new thing used to be OpenStack, the new thing now is containers. Um, there's, you know, pets versus cattle conversations and chickens. So, I, I think I had a presentation I do where I talk about, uh, you know, we got pets, which are the enterprise apps, we got chicken or cattle, which is in the cloud, and then we got chickens, which are containers. What do you got against chickens, man? Um, chickens live less lo long than cattle do, right? Less um, long. Less long. All right, Donald. Um, so there's always something we need, better networking, better, per, per, better persistent storage, those kinds of things, um, different development paradigm, you know, small ephemeral services. So uh, just like we heard in OpenStack, containers needs networking and storage. And in Docker 1.8, we finally got the storage provisioning bits, right? So there's always been the ability to do storage in containers, but uh, was there automated provisioning? And that really didn't come along until 1.8. Uh, it's gotten a lot better in recent versions, so it continues to mature. Uh, there's a whole circus, you can use a lot of an <laughs> analogies there, I'm trying to think of one that's appropriate, but we'll just say there's a whole circus around vendors and other people trying to provide plugins um, to rapidly fill in where this API allows you to, to work there. Um, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of stacking. We're going to talk about, uh, I, we think it's a pretty straightforward one, if you've got OpenStack, um, taking advantage of Cinder to get your volume services is pretty straightforward. Um, 
So, you know, we'll go through that. Docker volume plugins, it's simple. Volume API, again, it's, there's basically five commands. There's a couple more in the API, but there's basically, you know, create, delete, attach, detach, list, and that's all you get, that's all you care about. It does include provisioning. So when you say create, uh, it will go off to the back end. In this case, we're gonna talk about how that goes off to Cinder, um, and, it, and it will grab a piece of storage per your commands. Um, it runs as a daemon. The daemon needs to run everywhere that you want to consume services. So if you have Docker Engine on 300 hosts, you need to run the daemon on 300 hosts. Um, it, right now, it uses a simple Unix domain socket to talk to Docker, or Docker talks to it that way. Um, and it's JSON RPC. I already talked about that. It runs the, near the Docker Engine. Um, works with Swarm. It works with Engine. It works with Compose. It works with other things that consume Docker. So like I said, I'm going to try to do the Mesos demo um, and some Swarm demos at the end of this. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John here to talk for a while. All right. And, Thank uh, you. So Ed uh, has the unfortunate um, uh, pleasure of having worked for me, worked with me for a really long time. So I give him a really hard time on stage. Um, yeah. And I'm going to continue that tradition today. I'll, I'll pass it back. Um, do that a lot. So uh, anyway, so all this stuff's going on and everything else. Um, at the time when I started this, and some of you have seen this talk, um, there wasn't really a good solution, so I created one. Uh, I was bored sitting around one weekend and said, hey, I'm going to write a plugin. So I wrote a plugin. Uh, the whole intent of the plugin is it's written in Go. It's in Golang. Most of the stuff in Docker, Kubernetes, et cetera, is all Golang. So I stuck with that mantra. Um, and it is focused completely on Cinder, and that's it. I don't care about what's underneath. I don't have any vendor interests, anything like that. There's nothing associated with it. It is pure uh, Cinder. It is open source. Um, I gladly welcome contributors and feedback, and I was hoping for uh, community support and feedback and things like that, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. There's, I think there's some things going to change. Um, I license this under the um, I don't care what you do with it license. It's actually a thing. Look it up. Um, and it's kind of interesting because I've found a number of repos out on GitHub where people are doing whatever they want with it. And so that's kind of cool. Um, but so this is the part where most of the OpenStack development community, especially the Cinder guys, um, get kind of freaked out because I don't have these as part of any organization or grouping or anything like that. They are not a sanctioned OpenStack project, not even a big tent project. Um, and they're not a Docker project. So they're just in my own personal GitHub, publicly available, do what you want. So some people like that, some people don't. Um, those people aren't here, but there's one person I know that if he saw this, he would literally have a stroke. So, and it would have been cool if he was here, because, well, you know. Um, so how does this all work? So the, the thing that's kind of cool, in, in, in all seriousness, the actual point of, of this exercise was more to show um, that Cinder is actually something that's valuable outside of OpenStack or outside of a Nova context, right? And that was kind of the whole idea. So that's, that's kind of what I was hoping to kind of raise awareness about and kind of get people thinking about and things. Um, because the reality is, any consumer of storage, any consumer of block storage out there isn't really any different than Nova. We're all doing the same thing. We're creating, attaching, detaching, deleting. I mean, that's, that's what we do with storage. So it doesn't really matter. Um, so the whole concept and the whole idea is trying to drive the point that you can use Cinder for other things. Um, and you should use Cinder for other things. You've already invested in OpenStack. You have a cloud, and you have all these backends that are abstracted and everything else. There's no reason to go out and reinvent the wheel and write a new abstraction, you know, whatever it might be. And I won't say some of the companies that are doing this. Um, you might as well just use what's there. There's, there's no point in writing another one. So create a volume, attach a volume. It's all the same stuff, right? Um, I always do this just because... Uh, Docker gets a lot of hate, <laughs> um, so I like to give them some love. Uh, I think they're doing a great job. I love what they've done in 112. Um, it's made my life easier. Things are fantastic for me. Uh, some things break once in a while, sure, but you know, OpenStack, we probably really shouldn't cast stones about that, right? So, all right, so. I'm going to go into some things here, and I'm going to skip through most of this because we thought, rather than look at screenshots and videos and stuff like that, Ed's going to be brave, and he's going to do live demos. 
and I'm going to heckle them and laugh at them when they fail. So. And if it doesn't work, we have a video that you're going to annotate, yeah. right? Yeah. And so the good part is these uh, screenshots are in the deck, so if you get yeah. the deck, which is already up on SlideShare, you can look at the screenshots instead of having to watch the video and go back yeah. to it. So, yeah, so a couple of things. Um, there's the, the slides are on SlideShare, and I also have all of this stuff up on a blog, and it has his blog, and we link to each other, so you can find all that stuff. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, take our OpenStack cloud. Uh, just all we have on there is compute networking and storage right now. And we're going to mix in our chocolate, which is Docker. And then we're going to throw in a little frosting, which is our Cinder Docker driver that we're talking about. And we're going to make a nice tasty treat. So I'm going to go ahead. Actually, you don't even need these, do you? I'm going to let Ed take over and show you what all I just right. skipped. We'll try this here. The screen uh oh. Uh, no, 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 we're, 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 all right. So um, I'm VPN back into Denver, and so let's uh, we have it. We'll do the Docker Swarm stuff first, right? Because I have both of these set up. We'll try to do that. So uh, and you can tell me what I'm forgetting here to do. So Docker volume ls. Um, is the first thing we want to look at. It'll give us some stuff. Um, I have a test volume one, two, three, four, or five. Uh, so we've created that. We can actually go back and look through our. Um, yeah, there's my cursor. We can go actually look at our uh, OpenStack here. So I, one of the things you have, you, you have to do, and it's a good practice, is to. Um, and this is going to kick me out here, so I'm going to log back in. Uh, make <laughs> different users for each of these. So I have a, a, a user for Swarm. I have a user for Mesos. Um, again, we've got a little latency here, so we're going to go uh, we'll log into Swarm here. Um, and hopefully, demo gods look, look upon us well here. We'll Ethernet actually see gods. this. Um, so the other thing we can do we'll, while we're right doing that, Docker volume. I can type right, create. Uh, and then we give it the driver. So you can have multiple of these. So again, we talked about there's a lot of, I don't know, you want to annotate while I type? Go yeah, ahead. sure. Um, yeah, so okay, so what Ed's doing here is he's going to go ahead and create. Um, one of the options is a minus D. So you specify what driver you want. If you leave that out, you just get the default AUFS driver inside the Docker. Um, you can have multiple drivers uh, on, on a single machine. So you could have a NetApp, a SolidFire, a Ceph, a Gluster, whatever you want, and have all of them running simultaneously on the same nodes, and then just pick whichever one you want. Now, the beauty of Cinder is it does all that for you, so you just run the one and talk to all of them, right? So the next thing is the name. Obviously, you get to provide a name if you want. And then the size, size in gigabytes, and then type. So we take all of the same parameters that you can pass into Cinder, and we Go ahead and we abstract those and, and pass them back up so that you can actually get those from the Docker API as well, right? The only difference is you use the minus O or the option method instead of the minus volume type. So, so we literally, we got that one. Um, we should be able to go in here in our OpenStack uh, and see that we have our two volumes in here. So the second one I created was 20 gig. First one was a gig. If they're both there, you can see the different types. Anything else you want to say about that? Perfect. No. Nope. All right. So then we would do something like uh, Docker run, keep talking. <laughs> so now we're going to launch a container. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, attach this volume to that container when it boots up, right, or when it launches. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, it, it works. This is one thing that works a little bit differently than what we typically do inside of OpenStack. Because what happens here is we go to that volume, and when we want to mount it, in Docker and in containers, what we're doing is we're dealing with file systems. We're not dealing with raw block devices. So what that means is the first thing we're going to do before we go into the container is we're going to partition that disk and we're going to put a file system on it. Uh, right now, by default, I just use ext4 for everything. Uh, it's configurable. You can change that around and you can put something else on there if you want. So. Uh, he's already done it. Uh, you can see the, the arguments. Minus V is the volume, and the first argument is the name of the volume from the Docker perspective. And the other side of the colon there is where you want to attach that volume inside of the container. Uh, and then, of course, he's using Ubuntu, and he's launching a bat interactive uh, bash shell. So there you can see there's our volume. Yay. 20 gig volume. 
All right, so part of the demo gods shined upon us. Let's go, um, let's actually log back into this uh, and look at what's on the, the base operating system just for a second here. We get there. Um, You're cut off at the bottom there, buddy. Yeah, I see. Oh, you can see up there, never mind. All right, You're we'll, good. We'll put a few. So, you wanna talk about that? That's on the host. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, similar to how, so for those of you that are familiar with how OpenStack and how Nova works, the way we do attachments to an instance is we actually go ahead and we make a connection to the compute node or the compute host. And then what we do is we pass that in. We pass that through the virtualization layer. We do the exact same thing with Docker. So what we're gonna do is we're going to create, in our case, for, for what we're doing here, we're going to create an iSCSI connection. We're gonna iSCSI attach it to the Docker host and we're gonna mount it, put the file system on it like I talked about and everything else, mount it, and then pass it into the container as a file system. And I'm just kind of showing some of the other bits of it here that you, you yeah. may or may not wanna see with the iSCSI connection and the, how it translates into the one. So, um, so let's go back to this. We'll get so out the, of the, the thing that's cool about this and the, and the thing to keep in mind and the reason why um, you know, depending on who you talk to and some of the 12 factor app zealots and, you know, things like that and, you know, which side of the, the fence you're on on that doesn't really matter. The reality is if you have cases where you want to have persistent storage and you want to use it like a database and things like that, you want to be able to actually have that transfer across a cluster, whether it's a swarm cluster or a Mesos or, you know, just your own hard, uh, your own, uh, bare metal cluster, or whatever it might be. So with things like iSCSI, that's incredibly easy, and that, that's why it's a good choice for OpenStack as well, right? So all you have to do is disconnect and reconnect somewhere else, and you can just move that around. So with Swarm, for example, your container goes down, your node goes down, Swarm automatically detects that, it knows, it responds that same container somewhere else on another node, it also takes the volume with it for you. So you don't even have to worry about that. It just does it all for you. Mm. Aha, so I'm gonna have to go pull that. So I wrote a test file here just out to that, to that volume. And so I'm gonna go create a swarm service here. Um, it appears that it's not in my buffer. So we're gonna pull it out of my <laughs> magical uh, list of things here just because we don't wanna see me type this and screw it all up. So we'll crib notes, we need crib notes. Um, so that just, so go ahead, keep talking. You see what I did there? You gotta, uh, I'm making this up as there? we go, so I'm kind of screwing it. He's gonna screw with me, I'm messing with him, so. Yeah, um, whatever, dude, that's completely wrong. No. Uh, so what Ed's doing right now is, for those of you that haven't used it, um, check it out. You can look at, uh, like I said, the slides or just go out and Google it. But the, the Docker 112 stuff with the built-in swarm makes life really, really easy. So you can just go ahead and um, you can combine that with Docker machine and talk directly to your OpenStack cloud. So you can have Docker do things like go out and create instances for you, install Docker, install your, uh, your uh, uh, security keys, everything else, set everything up for you, and have a running swarm cluster in a matter of, of minutes. I mean, the, the only thing that takes any time is how long it takes to install the software, and that's it. It's, it's really, really awesome. So you do that, and then what you do is you create a service. So the way Swarm works is you create a service that's made up of a, a group of hosts inside of your Swarm cluster, right? So that's what Ed's working on right, right. now. Right, so I, I did that, I started it up. Um, I actually put a, a web service in here, so it just runs a, a browser or a, a LS files listing here in the root, so we can go in and see, now that this is attached to a different thing, I should have, oh, I connected it to my other volume. So um, we'll go do this again. So this is one thing, though, while you're here, um, for folks that if you try this, one thing that is kind of um, interesting, and we can fix this if, if people are interested, by default, we just do a raw makefs and, and create the file system in there. Um, if you are using this for things like SQL and stuff like that, you could run into a little problem because we use the defaults and you get a lost and found directory. And if you don't go in and delete that, uh, sometimes MySQL gets a little upset with you. MySQL gets upset, my MariaDB does not. Okay. So I'm gonna kill my service, I'm gonna restart this again because I connected it to um, the volume that was already there. So we're gonna go back and connect it to the volume that I made that file in. So I gotta go, go back. <laughs> Um, so one of the things you'll see if, if, you're, if you're watching this, I know it's getting cut off a little bit at the bottom here. 
No, you're good in the back. It's actually okay. just on here. Um, is that that one, that whole command went off and created yet another volume because I didn't give it. Um, so now I'm going to give it to six, seven, eight, so, nine. So and I, I don't want to talk about this real quick, right? So yep. uh, things are a little bit different, right? It, it's it's a little bit different, but it's the same. <laughs> so yep. when you have a when you have a service and you're dealing with a service, it's a little bit more complex and there's a few more options. But you can kind of figure out, right? So they change the syntax, and now what you're doing is you're actually given a mount command, and you're telling it specifically, hey, I'm mounting a Docker volume. That's that's really important. So. When I first started doing this before the documentation came out and before 112 was official, um, it took me a while to figure out why yep. things didn't work. So, um, so and you can see you're you're given it type volume, you're saying the source, destination, et cetera, et cetera. So all the same options that we did before with just native Docker volume API are still there, um, but unfortunately the syntax has changed and you have to do it a different way. Um, but that's life. So one thing I'll point out here is I did that second time I did this, I gave it a volume that already existed, and you'll, we're gonna prove that it didn't actually go create that again. So I, even though I gave it all these commands of where the volume driver was, what size I wanted, um, it's still gonna be our 20 gig volume because the name is the key here. So test one, two, test six, seven, eight, nine um, is a name that I already created, so it won't go create another one. Um, that's just the way Docker does it. So when we go over here to, jump over here to this guy and we, we, uh, we refresh him, there's our test file. So that proves that it was there and it stayed in that volume. Um, if you guys want to see, we can go download it and, and <laughs> open it, right? So it's still there. Um, so that's pretty interesting. The other thing, and I'll let you talk again. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go. So that it's running on D1. So I got three nodes, D1, D2, D3, creative. Uh, if I docker um, PS here, I can find that container. And if I docker kill, um, that container ID, now this is not through service, but I'm gonna kill it, and the Docker swarm will actually go and, um, respawn, and it. respawn it, Somewhere so we're else. gonna watch that here. So Ed had mentioned how we don't actually recreate the volume and stuff like that, right? So what we do is any time that Docker, create, Docker volume create call comes in, what we do is we go to Cinder and we do a Cinder list and catalog through it and try and find that volume. Um, so if it exists, we just use it. If it doesn't, we create it. And there you can see it's now on D2, so it moved. Um, Swarm moved it over to D2. Uh, if you want to so, see this, we can reproduce it. So. Yeah, we believe you. Yeah. Um, but the thing that's cool, right? So, so people sometimes people ask, you know, what's the big deal about containers, right? Um, I can do all these same things with OpenStack. And some people don't realize that you can do all of these same things with, with OpenStack. You can do these failover type things and stuff like that. But the difference is, you can't do it in three seconds. Um, that's the difference, and that's what's pretty cool, right? And, and you can keep playing this game. You can have a cluster of, you know, 10 nodes, and you just sit there and just take them down and just watch that thing go around Robin all the way through. So, and it takes about two seconds at most. So now I'm gonna cut over to, uh, we'll jump over to Mesos here, Marathon. Um, just kind of, if you haven't seen the GUI before, there you go. Um, you can hit the create an application button, but I'm gonna actually do this through Postman and just submit this through the API. So I have a, uh, I don't know, you wanna talk about this or you? No, this is all you. This is all <laughs> me, all right. So um, basically Marathon defines things with a YAML file with, or a JSON file here. So we've got this, uh, this JSON file. A couple things to point out here is that you, you've got you're telling it that it's a container. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, I guess it's big up there. Um, tell them it, telling it's a container, you're telling it it's a Docker container. So Meso, or Marathon is going to call into Docker through the Docker API, and then it's going to use Docker's capability to go off to volume, the Docker volume service, and get these volumes. So um, that's the next couple lines here where you're passing these parameters where I say what the Docker volume driver is, and then I say I want a volume, and I'm going to give it... Um, a name here called meetup MySQL Cinder, and then I'm gonna tell it where to mount it. So what I'm gonna build, what I'm actually building here is um, PHP my admin uh, talking to a MySQL database just to get us something that we have a two factor or a two um, piece app here. Um, I actually have Mesos DNS set up, so this will find itself no matter where it runs. Um, it takes a second, but um, you simply, you know, got the right, yep. So we simply submit this 
uh, through Postman into the Mesos API. You'll see it comes back here, or the Marathon API, and it gives us a, a, an ID. So from there, we can actually continue through the API. Um, I like Postman because I can, it's got the editor, I can just hit submit, but we'll, we'll duck over here to this, and you'll see that um, the meetup example where we started this, building this example here is created, and then it builds a file system of the different parts. So we've got the database and the My, My PHP admin. Um, when we go in here, you'll see that's the service is running as a container. Um, and you saw the other one in there, which is the MyPHP admin. So if we drill into these, you can get all the details. You can see down here, this is running on um, these different set of hosts. This one's called Container1. One, um, and there's the ID. If we killed it, it would start up somewhere else, but that's not what we want to do here. We want to actually go in and look at the MyPHP admin. Um, that's running on Container2. So these have to do a service discovery and find each other, because Mesos will schedule them wherever. Right, that's the, the interesting thing. Um, so then we can actually fire this up, and if all the demo gods worked well, it comes hey. up, and uh, if I can remember what the password was that I put in here, so we'll have to go <laughs> look over here. So we're passing all this stuff in as environment variables. Uh, root password was like password one, yep. So we should be able to... It's much better than password two. Uh, log in and password manager. So um, sometimes if I go through more, I mean, we kind of chase the service around with Swarm. Uh, Mesos and Marathon will do the same thing. We can go kill them. Um, but I, I'll create a database table in here. I mean, you can see that the basic database has been created and it's talking to it. And so you can use the Docker, well, it's going to do its favorite thing here. Um, so for those that are wondering um, and, and may not know, some, some people may be asking a common question I get is, can I use this with Kubernetes? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, so as of right now, and probably for the foreseeable future, Kubernetes does not actually leverage the Docker volume okay. API. So it doesn't have any interaction with that. So Demo God said we're done. Right. Kicked us out. And, um, and, uh, so there's, there's no, uh, so they use a completely different model. Um, the good news is, as of recently, a couple of weeks ago, they have decided to have an official volume API so that we can now develop to and we can create something to use that. So since Kubernetes is all the rage and everybody loves it, uh, that'll be the next thing. So um, along those topics, did you have anything else you wanted to? No, nah, that's, I mean, that's um, what you want to see. The, you the want other to... thing I wanted to touch on is, uh, is as far as this project goes, um, I started this quite a while back. Um, it's, it's been moderately interesting and some people are interested in it and using it. Um, since then, uh, there has been a uh, group of folks in the Courier project inside of OpenStack that are kind of launch uh, a similar thing. Uh, so I'm actually going to meet with them tomorrow and look at maybe working with them and converting all of the stuff I did into Python and adding it to some of the stuff that they've already done and seeing what we can do to actually make it an official big tent project. Um, so that's kind of where things are going. So hopefully in the future, um, rather than j-griffiths GitHub, it will be on the OpenStack GitHub. Um, so that would kind of be the idea. So. That's the name. It, that's not how it's pronounced. Um, so I didn't say the name because of the way it's pronounced, but uh, it's, it's actually F-U-X-I. Um, you guys can imagine how the pronunciation works. I'm sure that it's pronounced, maybe that is how it's pronounced uh, where it's supposed to be, but um, uh, so yeah, there's Fuxi, we'll call it Fuxi. Um, uh, so Fuxi is out there. Um, it's, it's a little different approach. It's written in Python, so that's good. So it can be in the, in the OpenStack ecosystem without any challenges or anything like that. Uh, there's a little difference in performance and things like that that you're going to get. Um, and also, there's a number of things missing right now. So, uh, but I was thinking I could probably pick that up and, and run with it and get something going. I would, it would be interesting to try and get something with the Golang stuff just because that's native to Docker um, working inside of, of OpenStack. Uh, but the reality is it's just a Unix domain socket. So. Docker doesn't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, so it can be Python. It can be Ruby. It can be whatever you want. So there's no reason to, to rock the boat or make things, make life more difficult because then you've got to come up with an infrastructure and a CI and everything else. And 
So it's a lot easier to just use the, the cookie cutters that we already have. So if we've got a little time left, I'm just, uh, one of the things that's interesting here is I'm going to actually to Cinder and creating another volume. So the, the, the nice part is we get all the Cinder features. So snapshots, clones, those kinds of things um, come along in Cinder that aren't supported in Docker. So uh, I just created another volume here. And when we go back to this guy, uh, we'll see Uh, he shows up in there, another volume. So we're just looking for all the volumes that are in that tenant in Cinder. And so now if I wanted to do things like create a bootable volume, which we wouldn't be bootable here, but we might have an image that's in Glance and we're gonna lay that down so when it gets mounted in the container, it just happens. And we can do that through Cinder commands, which gives us all the features and yeah. functions and we can extend volumes, which Docker doesn't support. We can change types, which Docker hasn't built support for. So. So having Cinder on the back end really brings you a lot of value yeah. to that stuff. It, and and that, that's a really good point. And so one of the things that, that some people ask is why would I do this as opposed to using the vendor XYZ's you know, plugin and talking directly to the back end. Um, that's the main reason. So all of the stuff that you get from Cinder, you now by default kind of have in Docker, right? Which is, which is a pretty big win. Uh, it's a significant consolidation of effort and a consolidation of code that you know the big thing is is the whole you know the whole Linux mantra is basically do one thing do it really well and then build on top of it so the premise here is let cinder do the abstraction stuff let it do it very well and build one small layer on top of that and then so on and so forth so that's kind of the idea right so I mean there's lots of bits where I can go and create the volume from the snapshot and creative is basically creating a clone. Um, so I don't know what else you want me to show, John. I don't know. Does anybody want to see anything? Any, any questions? So uh, the question was, what does the types mean, and what does gold mean? So inside of Cinder, we have a concept of volume types, and the nice thing about volume types is you can make them whatever you want. So it's an arbitrary label for metadata. So an administrator has the ability to go in and create a type, and they can call it foo or gold or whatever they want. And then they can assign extra specs metadata key value pairs to that type. Now the end user doesn't see that information. It could be, it could be something like this customer's lame, charge them double. Who knows, right? It could be whatever they want. Um, but when that, when that person says, hey, give me a type of gold, and in this case, what we did is we used gold to signify higher performance storage. Yeah, and, and, the, and the way that works is that works because the Cinder scheduler then looks at all of its backends and tries to match the filters that it has based on what you passed in in that type. If you want to talk about it, I'm putting this up on the screen. Sure. So if you want to talk. Uh, so I'm using ext4 right now, but you can configure that and change it. If you wanted to use XFS or ext3 or whatever you wanted, you could change that. Uh, I see. So. so if you guys, the question on volume types, I just kind of put it up on the screen here. So you saw a list of volume types. Um, you'll notice on the list it's just kind of scrolling off there. Um, they're all on solid fire right now, but that could be multiple backends. So that could be, you know, an EMC, a pure uh, LVM. Ceph, well, we can't do Ceph because we don't do iSCSI on Ceph. Yeah. And then down here are the parameters we're passing to the, for the different quality of services. So again, these are all solid fire, so we're using solid fire semantics here. But if you were passing these into a NetApp backend, um, they have a different semantic for their, what they do for QoS, so. And, th and that's a good point. Uh, the, this particular th thing that I have right here is iSCSI only. It, it yep. doesn't do RVD, it doesn't do fiber channel, any of those. That is one of the other advantages of bringing it under the, the courier umbrella, is then we could use the internal things and have folks internally test it. Um, so, uh, yeah. small QA. Uh, what happens when you create uh, two volumes with the same name in OpenStack and then try to you use got, Docker? To do? You got big problems. Um, yep. Yeah. So that's bad news. Um, unfortunately, uh, Cinder still does not enforce unique names. Um, I always tell people, pick a control plane, one or the other, not both. You know, Ed was demoing how you can do that, yep. um, but you really shouldn't. So 
what I do right now in the Docker code is if I see more than one volume with a name, I error out and say, sorry, you've got two, I don't know what to do. So. Um, Good question. Something else that, that I've looked at, and again, if, if this lives on and goes forward, what I'll do is I'll stash the UUID from Cinder inside of the object on the Docker side, and I'll use that as a, as a source of truth. Most of that code's already there, so it's not hard. Okay, yep. So the question was, how does the volume attachment actually happen? And do you mean from the Docker host perspective or from the Docker container's perspective? Or both? Okay, container. Um, well, okay, so uh, it's still kind of the same thing. So, so let's say we have a volume that we've already created and used. Um, uh, or no, let's actually, let's start from scratch. So we don't have a volume. Uh, we say Docker run volume, uh, you know, minus D, cinder, uh, volume, umpty, whatever. Um, what's going to happen is it's going to go, the, the Docker, uh, Docker is going to make a call down to the Cinder driver and it's going to ask it, hey, do you have a volume named umpty? If it does not, it will say, okay, create it. And so we'll go off and we'll go to Cinder and we'll call Cinder create volume with all the options and stuff like that and create that volume. And then what's going to happen a little bit later in the process is Docker is going to come back to the, doc, the Cinder driver again, and it's going to say, "Hey, I want you to attach this volume." So inside of that driver, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to find that volume again. I'm going to grab it and I'm going to inspect it. I'm going to do an iSCSI attach and I'm going to inspect it and see if it has a file system on it. If it has a file system on it, all I'm going to do is I'm going to mount it. That's it. If it does not have a file system on it yet, I'm going to run a makefs on it and format it. After that, I go ahead and I send that information where I mounted it back up to Docker. Docker now knows what to do with mount points, and it just passes it into the container. And that's it. So those, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Docker's kind of interesting. Um, it, they, they really are pretty serious about this save no state thing, right? So, so if you go on the back end and you delete that volume on Cinder, so the question was what happens if, a, if somebody goes to Cinder directly and deletes the volume? Um, it's gone, it's done. I mean, that's, that's, that's the end of that. Um, now, if you go then and you say Docker volume LS, uh, you, you won't see that volume unless Docker got in a weird state and cached the information somewhere, which it sometimes does. Um, but yeah, typically what happens is all of a sudden Docker doesn't know about the volume anymore either. If it's actually actively in use and attached and you try to do that, Cinder will fail to do the delete. It will say, hey, you can't delete this, it's in use. Good questions. I'm doing this all on the screen while you're, while you're watching if you're... <laughs> It will delete. Uh, it won't. It will. Not, it should. It will not delete. Cinder won't let you delete a volume that's in an attached state. Yeah. So. I was asking this. Uh, this would, uh, in general, uh, Zoom context, uh, I want to uh, work out uh, the attached volume in Zoom project. Oh, so you want to use Docker volume plugin for something else? Uh, yes, for, for Zoom project. Maybe you are aware of that. I'm not actually. No. no. Yeah. I'm, Okay. Yeah, we should chat. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you're doing. Yeah. It'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I don't know when our time is probably up, I think, so 40 sure. minutes usually. Uh, any other questions? Quick? We'll be up here for a bit afterwards. Oh, one more? Uh, <laughs> so, yes, as a matter of fact, there, there has been for quite some time. So. There's a, there's a uh, uh, SolidFire GitHub, um, and it has one. But one of the nice things about um, the acquisition and the merger of SolidFire and NetApp, NetApp actually has a, a really cool team of folks that are focused almost exclusively on Docker and containers. They've created a, uh, a project called um, DVP, Docker Volume Plugin, which is a, a NetApp Docker Volume Plugin. It, they were able to just take my code that I wrote and 
put it into that NetApp DVP, and it has support for SolidFire, CDOT, FAS, all the, all the NetApp portfolio. So you've got options. It's kind of cool. There's a lot of choices out there. Um, so It happens um, to be loaded on this machine, too, so there's one from a NetApp box. I didn't give it a size or anything, but it's... All right, last one, because they're dimming the lights. Yeah, yeah, you need OpenStack. Um, well, actually, actually, no, you, you, you clarify. You don't need OpenStack, you need Cinder. And one of the things that people don't really understand is installing Cinder is actually pretty easy. Um, it's all of the other stuff that comes with it that makes things a little bit more interesting. Um, Cinder is actually really easy to install. All you need is the Cinder services, MySQL, and Rabbit, and you're done. And and Keystone. Keystone. But we're working on changing that. So, so I actually have that on this yesterday. laptop here. I have a, a very nice setup on a single VM that has just those things in it that I was able to, I can use to develop stuff on the planes back and forth. So um, fully standalone setup to do this on a single VM on that laptop. So I didn't demo off of that today, but we can. So. All, right. All right, with that, cool. I think we'll wrap up. And uh, the next guy, I, you, you look like you're here to present. No? All right. <laughs> so, all right. All right, cool. Thanks, cool. everyone. Thanks.